Hey guys, in this lesson, let's talk about principal component analysis, or PCA for short. We'll start with looking at some interview questions, and then we'll talk about what is PCA, how does PCA work, and the pros and cons of PCA. So let's start with looking at some interview questions. What is principal component analysis? How does it work? Explain the sort of problems you would use PCA for. Describe PCA's formulation and derivation in matrix form. What are the pros and cons of PCA? Explain its limitations as a method. All right, let's start with reviewing what is PCA. PCA is a dimensionality reduction technique that transforms input features into their principal components. It converts a set of observations of possibly correlated features into a set of values of linearly uncorrelated features. The goal of PCA is to map the data from the original high-dimensional space to a lower-dimensional space that captures as much of the variation in the data as possible. It aims to find the most useful subset of dimensions to summarize the data. For example, we have a data with three features, x1, x2, and x3. We can use PCA to extract the first principal component that captures the most variance in the data. There are two facts about PCA that are worth mentioning. The first one is PCA does linear transformation. PCA finds a sequence of linear combinations of features that have maximum variance and are uncorrelated. Another fact is that PCA is an unsupervised learning method. It means that it does not use class labels to do dimensionality reduction. OK, now let's look at how does PCA work. We will first look at the general idea of PCA, and then we will dive into the details of the algorithm step by step. So the general idea of PCA is to find principal components. Principal components are the directions of maximum variance, which has the effect of minimizing the information loss when you perform a projection or compression down onto these principal components. So why maximum variance means minimum information loss? I was struggling with this when I was learning PCA. So I will try my best to explain this part to you, and let me know if you have any questions. OK, suppose xi is an example in the original dataset. You can consider xi as one of these blue dots in the original dataset. And v is a principal component, which is a vector. And aiv is a transformed data point using PCA. So how do we know aiv is a good transformation or reconstruction of the original data point? What we do is that we look at the mean squared error, MSE, between xi and aiv. And our goal is to minimize this mean squared error. We want to minimize the distance between xi and aiv so that v would most closely transform xi. This makes sense, right? Now, ai here is a scalar and it can be calculated easily giving v the vector because it's simply the projection of xi onto v. And then the problem becomes finding v to minimize the residual variance the variance of the errors. Now, if our goal is to minimize the variance of v, the vector v, then v should be the direction of maximum variance of the data. This is the only way we can make sure the residual variance is minimum. In other words, PCA reduces the average of all the distances of every feature to the projection line, vector v, so it projects into the direction of maximum variance to minimize distance from the original data point to its new transformed data point. And that's what we mean by minimize the information loss. I have just showed you a simple example using vector v to reconstruct the original data point. If the features is high dimensional and we want to use multiple principal components, then let's say we have two principal components, then xi will be aiv1 plus biv2 plus m, and m is an error term. You can see in this diagram, the second principal component is orthogonal to the first one. And this applies not only to the first two principal components, this applies to all principal components, because all principal components are uncorrelated or orthogonal to each other. So the second principal component is mathematically guaranteed to not overlap with the first one. Even if the input features are correlated, the resulting principal components will be mutually uncorrelated. So principal components can be treated as independent features. Another way to look at principal components is that they are vectors 
that define a new coordinate system in which the first axis goes in the direction of the highest variance in the data, the second axis is orthogonal to the first one and goes in the direction of the second highest variance. And we have explained earlier why principal components should capture the highest variance of the data. Okay, now we have the general idea of PCA. Let's look at the steps in the procedure. There are five steps in total. Let's go over them one by one. The first step is to standardizing the data. PCA is sensitive to the relative scaling of the original feature. So we need to standardize the features prior to PCA if the features were measured on different units and assign equal importance to all features. This diagram visualizes two naive based classifiers. One is using the training data after PCA, and the other one uses standardized training dataset after PCA. And there's a clear difference between the accuracy of these two classifiers. The accuracy for the normal or unscaled test dataset with PCA is over 81%, versus the accuracy for the standardized test dataset with PCA is over 98%. As you can see, there's a clear difference between the performance of these two classifiers, even if the original dataset is the same. So standardization or z-score normalization is an important pre-processing step for PCA. Standardization will largely impact the performance of the algorithm. Okay, the next step is to compute covariance metrics. We want to obtain the covariance metrics of the original features. Let's say if we have three features in the original dataset, then this is what the covariance matrix looks like. The covariance matrix is a special case of the square matrix, which means the matrix is the same as its transpose. After we obtain the covariance matrix, the next step is to decompose the matrix into eigenpairs, the so-called eigen decomposition. Eigen decomposition is a factorization of a square matrix into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. This equation applies to all square matrix. A is a square matrix, V is an eigenvector, and lambda is an eigenvalue. So we can decompose the covariance matrix sigma into eigenpairs. The goal of eigen decomposition is to help us find principal components. Eigenvectors of the covariance matrix represent the principal components, and the corresponding eigenvalue define their magnitude. Step 4 is to choose k principal components, and k is less than or equal to d which is the dimensionality of the original dataset. We simply sort the eigenpairs in descending order of the eigenvalues. The eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue will be the first principal component, and the eigenvector with the second largest eigenvalue will be the second principal component, and so on. Now you might be wondering, how do we select the number of principal components? How do we determine the optimal k? There are different methods we can consider to determine the value of k. The first method is that we have a specific percentage of variance we want to retain from the original dataset, for example, 90%. Then we can base on this value to determine how many principal components we want to select. Another idea is we choose a cutoff when it becomes apparent that adding more principal components doesn't get much more variance. For example, in this diagram, we look at principal component index and explained variance ratio. We can see that the first principal component is about to explain 40% of the variance in the data. And the first two principal components are able to capture about 60% of the variance in the data. And adding more principal components does not help us with getting more variance from the data. So we can choose the first two principal components to represent the data. Another idea is to consider the specific use case of PCA. If we want to use PCA to help us visualize the data, then k should be 2 and at most 3. All right, the final step is feature transformation. We need to transform d-dimensional feature spaces x to k-dimensional feature subspaces x prime. x prime is x times w, where w is a projection matrix constructed from the top k eigenvectors that we have chosen from the previous step. Finally, let's look at the pros and cons of PCA. PCA removes correlated features and noise in the data. As we mentioned earlier, all the principal components are independent of each other. There's no correlation among them. The first few principal components can capture majority of variance in the data, and the rest just represent noise in the data. So by selecting the first few principal components, we are able to remove noise in the data. So PCA can be considered as a data preprocessing step 
before using a learning algorithm, and the transformed data are available to use for the learning algorithm. Another advantage of using PCA is that it improves algorithm performance. If the input features is high dimensional or very high dimensional, the performance of the algorithm will degrade. And PCA speeds up the algorithm by getting rid of correlated features and the noise which don't contribute in any decision making. The training time of the algorithms reduces significantly with less number of features. Finally, PCA helps with visualizing high dimensional data. PCA transforms a high dimensional data to low dimensional data so that the data can be visualized easily. Other than these advantages, PCA also has some downsides or limitations. The first thing to note is that PCA is not scale invariant. It is sensitive to the relative scaling of the input feature. So we need to make sure we standardize the feature prior to PCA. Another limitation, I would say this is the biggest limitation of PCA is that features become less interpretable. Principal components are the linear combinations of the original features, and they are not as readable and interpretable as original features. Another downside of PCA is that it's only based on the mean vector and the covariance matrix. Some distributions, such as multivariate normal distribution, are characterized by this, but some are not. It means that PCA might not work well for different datasets with different distributions. Finally, PCA is an unsupervised learning method. It does not take the class labels into account. This is not necessarily a downside, but it's something we need to know. If we want to consider class labels when doing dimensionality reduction, we need to consider other supervised dimensionality reduction methods, such as linear discriminant analysis.